Hi, everybody. Hello. Wasn't that a lovely, heartwarming movie? It is. It really is. Good evening. I'm Justin Lowe with The Hollywood Reporter, and I'd like to introduce our participants for the Q&A tonight. First up, we have co-star Eden Brolin. <laughs> Wonderful performance, wasn't it? And producer Ed McWilliams. And co-producer, Jack Williams. I'd also like to welcome actress, director, and author, Diane Ladd, who is a three-time... You stepped on my line. A three-time Oscar winner, sorry, nominee and winner of 35 international awards, including the British Academy Award. She has also found the time to serve and fight on behalf of her fellow actors as a board member of the Screen Actors Guild for the past decade. Please welcome your fellow SAG member, Diane Lack. <laughs> so Ms. Ladd, first question for you. Um, you have so much remarkable experience in the entertainment industry, along with dozens of different awards and nominations. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about some of the specific attributes that drew you to the role of Vera. Well, first of all, there's not a lot of work for women. Second of all, for older women. But more important than that, I'm one of the lucky ones that gets to work. And this script came to me and I read it. And I started to share Katie, our director's dream, that wrote it. I saw the potential in the script of what it could be. And hope burst forth in my heart about gentle cinema verte type films and how much we need them. And so I agreed to be part of this for these wonderful gentlemen who helped produce this and had fought so long and so hard to get the money. Katie was directing it, had written it, had worked very hard to put it together. And her husband was a, had a good reputation as a director of photography. And I thought, why the hell not? <laughs> you have two choices. You go and you do some movies for money, and sometimes you're lucky. Sometimes, once in a while, one of them's great. But you find the little films that come to you, and you pray that with all the circumstances and the problems of independent filmmaking, which are, are numerous today, and um, very, very difficult, very, very difficult. Um, after just leaving South Carolina about two weeks ago, worrying about alligators while being on my knees in a swamp and fighting mosquito bites and <laughs> big bugs and a wig that was made cheap that made my hair burst out in blisters, my head and my toes hurt from the wrong shoes and I had to go to a toe doctor. Same thing, I can promise you, actually, Katie's film was... Pretty well put together compared to that. <laughs> Especially I couldn't believe how professional it was for the budget. And sometimes you do a big budget film, my God, there's so many people on the set, you can't find anybody to help you. <laughs> now that's the truth. So you're saying you didn't mind the snow and the ice and the cold and the wind of uh, central New York winter. I did, I did mind it. <laughs> Like George Washington, I cannot tell a lie, but I tell you, I love that house I was in. It was a guru house, and it had a meditation room, and we all felt the energy, and um, I wanted to be part of this script. I had hope, and hope, you must always 
dream, even if it's too much. Okay. Didn't so you, I had hope. Didn't you feel like that house was be becoming a character in the movie as oh, the was. script went on? I, I mean, I know you guys spent a lot of time there. It was a it character was. in the movie. Yeah. And, um, and it had amazing energy. And I was privileged to be part of it. And um, it was a special treat. To that, that was actually the home of a guru who had died. And it had a very powerful energy. And sometimes we don't know why the trips we take in life, what they're for, or what the later the results will be, all the friendships that we make, all the experiences that we have. Things are not always as we expect. And you go forth in life and you thank God for the opportunities and you take the food that you're given to cook and by God, you kick dirt and make the best meal you can. That's all there is to it. <laughs> exactly, exactly, well put. So, so Ed, tell us a little bit about how you all put this meal together. What were some of the circumstances that brought this project to Adeclate Films? Well, uh, our other producer, Jay Thames, who's not here uh, tonight, met Katie Kokonos, the director at Sundance, and they started talking about projects. Jay and I have been looking for a project to work on together for a long time, and uh, this one finally felt like the one that we could do, and that we could do really well. Were you, were you familiar with Katie and her work before the project came to you all? I had read a script or two of hers mm -hmm. that I really liked, mm -hmm. But this was the one that you, when you read it, you just sort of realized this is, this is doable. Yeah. So what was your initial reaction when you read it? I mean, obviously from a producer's point of view, you want to know, can we make it for the budget that we think we can raise? Yeah, exactly. And Katie, uh, you know, the script sort of came about because Katie was writing these scripts and her husband, Alex, who's the cinematographer, mm -hmm. as Diane said, said, why don't we make something that we can shoot in our own backyard and something that I can, you know, do it in the winter when I'm not working so much. And so it was one of those, like a lot of indie films, you need a lot of help and a lot yeah. of things that you have to line it up just right, you know, and you have to know people who will give you the locations. Right. And we were lucky to get that house. And everything just kind of worked out, you know, and Diane came on board and then we're like, okay, well, now this is getting good, right, right. you know. So the so they live in the Hudson Valley in the, they do, in yeah. the area. So they were familiar with that and how they could put the film together for for a price. Exactly, yeah. And a lot of the people that worked on the film were their friends or uh -huh. the you know the the boutique store is one of Katie's good friends sure. owns it. So <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay, so there you go. So. Sounds like a very so familiar story. All those, you know, all those things you need. Right. Eden, while you were preparing for the role of Dora, were you able to draw on some of your own personal experience to develop the character of this quirky young woman? Sure, I think so. Can you be more I, think, I think everybody's got a little bit of that quirkiness uh -huh. to them, and... And I'm definitely myself, I think I'm a bit of a daydreamer and um, I think that was definitely an easy thing to relate mm -hmm. to. But as far as her personal life, uh, a lot of that I think was a bit hard to relate to and, and I, I don't think I've had much experience going out to the Hudson Valley to take <laughs> care of great aunts. Right. But, um, but uh, I think there's absolutely something to relate to. Mm -hmm. um, as far as seeing uh, a 20-something fresh out of college right. who's trying to decide if there's a right answer or right. not, and not like what is the right answer sure. necessarily, but, um, but being able to hear advice from her mother, being able to mm -hmm. hear advice from, from Diane's character, um, I, I think it, it hugely sheds light on, on that bit of struggle that 20-somethings sure, go through just when sure. they start realizing that their parents are not superheroes and right. they don't have all the right answers, but they're just trying to, to make sure that they don't make the same mistakes <laughs> that their parents sure. did. Um, but I, I think that was, a big, that, that was a big part of um, how I related to, to Dora. But uh, otherwise, Katie's voice was so strong in sure her character it that it was so easy to spend time with Katie and be able to pull a little mm, bit of, of Katie into Dora. Um, and not that, that Katie's exactly like Dora whatsoever, but 
but her voice was was very very prominent in in that character and in the writing in general so how did you feel about shooting those um, Jane Austen inspired scenes in uh, period costume in a winter setting? I want to be able to say it was amazing uh -huh. and I loved those costumes uh -huh. and it was so beautiful. <laughs> sure. But it was, it was goddamn cold. It was cold. Yeah. And I put those costumes on and, and we shot a few of them, but I put those costumes on and I was like, do I, am I going to get a jacket? <laughs> And I didn't want to. I didn't want to be like a brat on set and be like, "Guys, it's 18 degrees." But it was. Uh, it was a little bit of a struggle. But I had. I had some very nice snow boots on, oh, which was the the savior. Did you of the shoot shot. all those scenes consecutively the same day? Do you remember? I think Ed? so. We, some of them. We. I think we split one. Yeah. Uh -huh. But. I think those two snowy ones were the Pro same. Probably day, good though. idea. It, yeah. it was cold. Yeah. Man, <laughs> it's cold. 18 degrees, that's cold. Yeah, For sure, yes. for sure. Ms. Ladd, what can you tell, about, tell us about Katie's um, preparation process during pre-production? How did it compare with other projects that you've worked on recently? And was there much opportunity for y'all to rehearse? No, and I can't tell you anything about it because I don't know what her preparation, probably the gentleman can. Katie and I had a phone call and I think I got there a day or two before we started shooting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all time would allow and all she could allow and because of circumstances and the budget and pressure. But she was very professional and um, rather well prepared. And the sets were beautiful, I thought. But what her, uh, what her system was before that, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I wish she were here to answer that for you. I'm not in a position to put words into her mouth. Sure, sure. So I can't. Did you all have a chance to run scenes at all in the day or so before shooting started? Well, when each time we did a scene, we went through it once okay. or twice, uh -huh. and that's about all it allowed, too. We each had to do our own work, and I think if someone needed Katie, she was there for them. And um, as I said, we just tried to kick dirt. How many days did could. you shoot, Ed? 18. 18 altogether? Yeah. Yellow. Uh huh. <laughs> Get that meal on the table. <laughs> and, and you actresses must have been there for 17 or 18 out of 18 of those days because you're practically in every scene. No, I was there for about 11, I think, uh -huh. right? Yeah, I think I was there for 11. I think we shot on Saturday, too. I, I think she was there longer. <laughs> Eden was, was there, there for longer. all 18. And they shot Eden, and then I came in. Uh huh. And we did have time to hug and talk a little, get to know each other for like, what, five minutes? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, then uh, I, they had me for 11 days. Yeah. Yeah. Well. And then we did a couple pickup days in the city, that first sequence. That's, uh, the sequence that with at, ho her. at home yeah. in the apartment. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, so that, that alleviated a little bit of the schedule while you were shooting up in the valley. <laughs> Um, Jack, I was wondering if perhaps you could tell us something about um, Richard Linkletter's connection to the film and how he came on board as an executive producer. Yeah, well, uh, Katie and, and Rick go back a long time. They actually, uh, Katie helped Rick start the Austin Film Society way right. back in the day. And, uh, you know, she worked on Slacker and she worked on all these amazing films that were shot down in Austin. So they've, they've always had like a good, strong connection and known each other forever. And he was like so supportive, you know, he's, he was there from the beginning, like working on the script with Katie, working with us. He came out to set, you know, he wasn't just like a, a name on, on the poster. He was actually there on set, standing in that 18 degree weather, like right after winning <laughs> uh, Best Director at Berlin Hall for uh, Boyhood. Amazing, yeah. amazing. And, and you actresses, did you have a chance to interact with him at all? Have you worked with him before or? I had never met him before, and mm -hmm. I had to leave before he was oh. there, and then I had to leave. And I, I uh, met him and had wonderful talks and time with him in Austin when they showed this film at the film festival. Right. I do want to say one thing about the director, Katie. I want to say that she never once lost her temper that I saw, which is wonderful to have harmony, and that's very important to me. And she also never let you see when she was tired. <laughs> she bucked up and she just kept the energy going. And I was very proud of her as a female director, as a director period of any sex, 
for her energy and her efforts that she put forth as a, as a person. And I just wanted to applaud her for that. Of course, of course, very important. Um, Ed and Jack, may, maybe you can say a little bit of something about um, the atmosphere that you all tried to create as producers to give Katie the, the freedom and the time to, uh, to focus on her performance and, uh, and her shooting. Uh, yeah, well, it was just more a matter of figuring out what what she really wanted to focus on, and then us picking up, you know, the other the other stuff. Like for, she really wants to work with her actors, you know, and unfortunately, because of the time limitations, we didn't have a whole lot of time for rehearsal. But that's obviously a big part of what she wants to do and what Linklater does. And so she wanted her her a lot of her focus was there. Focusing on the actors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Her and characters. I got some, thank you. That. And then Alex, of course, was focused on mm -hmm. the focus, you know. <laughs> Pull, so. Pulling it and racking it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and did you actresses really feel that, that concentration from her on set that she was fully focused on, on you and, and your performances when the camera was rolling? Um, I really can't say whether I did or not because of the time limit. I, frankly, I was focused on my character, mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. being prepared and preparing as fast as possible, as much as possible mm -hmm. when I got there. But the thing that was so nice for me was that the sets were made to look so beautiful, like that, that set where, where she's sitting in the chair before she goes to shop, and it's a sunroom. And when I walked in and I was supposed to love that room and love looking out at my dormant garden, and the way they had it set up and the way Alex shot it, yeah. I was so happy in that room and the way he had it lit and looking out at the little bird feeders, where they put it, and it attracted the birds. And those little efforts and things, I didn't have to work hard to be happy mm -hmm. about it. And it also helped make me not only want the best for my birds, but want the best for my niece. <laughs> You know, it's very easy then to turn and have some authority when you see the animal kingdom being happy and you say it to her that she has, you're trying to get her to go after what she should do as a human being while she has life. And part of that was part of the set and part of Katie's preparation and part of Alex. So it really does all flow together. When you're swimming upstream to do a movie, like a salmon, it's very difficult. If people don't get along, if actors, if there's games played, I, I find that horrendous. I've been doing this, this stuff for 40, almost 50 years. And I find it so wonderful when there's harmony and kindness. It means a great deal to me. And sometimes you don't have it, and you have to rise above it and keep going. You know. Eden, were you feeling the same kind of thing on the set? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a great thing about Katie was that she was able to, especially as a first-time director, she she did her short film uh, a little while ago, but, but as a first-time feature director, it was amazing to be able to see her so accepting of uh, being able to have one ear open mm -hmm. to literally everybody mm -hmm. on set. And it was an unbelievable crew. I mean, they put an intense crew together. Like, they just worked their asses off. They were up at the crack it on. They were in the coldest of the cold. <laughs> but, and all, a lot of them from the Hudson Valley, too, and, and sure. New York locals, which was awesome. But, um, but it, you know, the, the producers were always on set. They did an incredible job. But I was just so impressed with the fact that Katie always had one, one ear open. Right. And, and she had one eye open for everyone's considerations. And I think that was... That was a huge part of what I saw in Katie's strength. Right, right, yeah. I would like to share one thing with you about independent films. This is very important to me. Um, we're fighting very hard to bring independent films to California. Now, I, <clears throat> I wanted to share with you back in 2001, my husband, Robert Hunter, was a member of the United States Chamber of Commerce. And we were invited down to the convention, and I was coming as the wife. And uh, got to talk to Mr. Donahue, who's the president, who said to me, why aren't you people making more films in Hollywood? <laughs> Better films. I said, why aren't we making films, period? We're not. And so he said, well, I told him what was going on from my POV, and he said, why aren't you screaming? So I came back and thought about it, and thanks to my husband's support, 
for the next four years of our life, we dedicated ourselves and actually, I'm sorry to say, spent our own money. A great deal of it went to Washington 17 times. Goodness, yeah. Talked and fought, passed out pamphlets, and finally, and I did not get all the help that I should have from my own Screen Actors Guild. Even though I was a board member, there was a deaf ear turned to me, which I could not understand. I didn't get the Director's Guild or the Writer's Guild or any guild to give me the support I needed. And we got support from some of our fellow show business people and fought. And my husband and I led a thing called the Act, which is the website's going to be back up because the, the, uh, the Congresswoman, who, uh, Karen McCarthy, who really helped us all, uh, died. And a lawyer there died, and we had to take the website down and start again. But it's called ACT, the Art and Culture Task Force. I want you to know for yourself, for independent movies, that we got the only tax incentive passed in 40 years. We only have one federal that Bush signed. I wasn't a Bush fan, but we got him to sign that bill in 2004. And it's still on, it's still up, and what it means, if you're trying to do an independent movie, it has to be two million or over for porno, to stop it, to stop porno. And then from two million to 15, you have a budget, if it's a deprived area, and every area is deprived right now, you can go up to 20 million. And your investor, you have a carrot to attract an investor. If he invests his money, he can get, um, what do you call it, Robert, what kind of? A depreciation in the year he makes the investment. So you have something, guys, to help you get some money for an uh, independent film. And New Orleans, Louisiana was the best. They did 23 pictures the next year. And then New Mexico came, and then Mississippi, and then some other states. But not California. And the lady who's on my board, Art and Culture Task Force, act will be up in another month on the website. I want you guys to all check it out. But one of my board members, and this is important for our films, one of my board members, two of them, Robert and Sharon Jimenez, they're both news people and they have fought for us. They're sitting right here tonight. They fought for all of you, unbelievable. It's called Bring Hollywood Home. And they're fighting like mad. No, and I would also just like to say that I was given an award recently from um, the Hollywood and West Hollywood and L.A. Chamber of Commerce called Hollywood Heroes. And I, I, I couldn't be here. So I sent a video. And I said, I'm sorry I can't be there. But I've been here in South Carolina for five and a half weeks doing a film because they give us tax incentives. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. Before that, I was in Boston for nine and a half weeks, doing a picture with David O. Russell, because they give us big tax incentives. I sure wish I could be home in California so they could give us tax incentives. So keep fighting and check out Bring Hollywood Home. Fight for yourselves, guys, because we all need work. Well, and, and we all need art and culture. Of course, and tax incentives are really important. Without them, you don't have a film. That and culture, if culture dies, you don't have a civilization. Mm -hmm. So there you go. <laughs> End of story. Um, so, Eden, I want to get back to you and ask, um, when you were preparing and performing with Ms. Ladd, were you looking to her for guidance with any acting techniques or any specifics about your character? Uh, I don't think necessarily specifics about the character, but I think immediately you hear somebody like Diane Ladd being on a a, a team, and, and you're just suddenly like, oh, this is a great opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to talk to somebody who's been around this business for such a long time and mm -hmm. been on set for such a long time. And I've been around sets and everything, but it's a totally different deal when when you're on an independent set, first of all, and then also when when you've got a minute to prepare and everything's going sure. at the speed of light 
um, but but no, it was it was really really amazing, and it was uh, it was a bummer that we only got a little bit of time together to to prepare. But I think it definitely, with the setting and all that, it just sort of um, melded together really easily. The the relationship became very organic in a way. Um, but but yeah, it was um, it was amazing to be able to to just be a watcher from afar when I when I could because we were working together so often, or I was sure. working and she was away, and um, so so having those moments were were definitely a little gems for me. I'll slip you twenty dollars later, okay? Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Ms. Ladd, what, what did you think were some of the important things? Did, was there anything sp specific you tried to convey in your performance or your, your understanding of Dora's character? Or did you feel that your performance itself was a demonstration enough of craft for, for Eden to benefit from that? Well, I never, for, uh, I wanted to do anything I could. I wanted to do anything I could for Eden that she needed as a young artist and a young performer coming up. And uh, I saw a great deal of talent, and I wanted to help her in any way I could. But regarding my character, all my characters, I have one message. There but for the grace of God go all of us. Whether I'm saint or sinner, I always start off with the attitude that most of us human beings do, that I am right. And what I'm doing is right. If you're committing murder, they think they're right. I mean, God help ISIS people, they think they're right. Whether they're insane or what, they think they're right. And everybody thinks they're right. And if they don't think they're right, they rationalize it to human being. I mean, the worst disease that humanity has is ego. And we all need it, and yet there's a big gap, a big gap in the ocean between the soul and the personality. And you have to say who's driving the car. So in every uh, character I do, I try to take that character to the edge of the cliff in, with the personality and the ludicrousness of their life. I try to take them to the edge of the cliff and please God, never over the cliff, which then becomes facetious or not real. And my only message always is don't judge each other too quickly. Don't judge her character too quickly. Don't judge my character too quickly. Some of you have parts of Dora in you. You may not have a house like her, but I bet you've been hurt like her. Nobody gets off scot-free. Everybody gets hurt somewhere. You say, to, you say to somebody, how are you feeling? They say, great. Which minute are you talking about? Was it the minute you found out a check bounced? Was it the minute you found out you didn't get that job? Was it the minute you found out, oh, God, I need four new tires? Was it the minute you found out somebody lied or betrayed you? We're all just there. And my whole MO is judgment, not to judge too quickly whether I'm saint or sinner. That's all. And that's important to me in the realm of the character that I birthed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well put, very well put. Ed, this, uh, this beautiful Hudson Valley house has been mentioned repeatedly in, in some detail. Um, how were these um, very expressive locations selected? Was it a matter of luck? Did you do a lot of scouting? Uh, well, with that house, both. Um, Vivekananda is the name of it now, as mm -hmm. Diane was saying. It's a, a group of nuns that are keeping the legacy of this guru. And so we looked for, so, we looked for houses and houses for weeks in the Hudson sure. Valley. And then we walked into that one and everyone knew immediately. Right. And it, you know, we had to do a lot of uh, production in there to change it because there's a, you know, it has a lot of the picture of the guru up. Yeah. And it has like couches you can't sit in because that's where he was sitting, you know. So right. we sort of changed it quite a bit to give it more of a Vera, right. Vera yeah. look. But it had all the books already, so it just had that. Yeah, that, w that was actually my next question. What, what all did, what were some of the things you did to dress the set to try to characterize the home as, as Vera's home in a, a space that, um, that Dora, as an interloper, was coming into? Yeah, all that. I mean, we were just lucky that the nuns allowed us to shoot there because I think other people had sought it out before, but they didn't allow mm -hmm. those shoots for whatever right. reason, and we right. went and met them, and they were very kind, you know, and we were respectful of yeah. their 
private space. Did they read the script? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Did you tell actually. them Diane? I told them the story. <laughs> Did you tell I told them? them about Diane, and that I think you know they all knew her, and they had some books she had written before. So there you go. So there that you go. might have sealed the deal. Uh, Ms. Ladd, maybe you could describe a little bit about your process for externalizing Vera's character. She has an eventful and fascinating history, um, but how are you able to bring that background into her relationship with Dora? Her, her life with her husband, Theo, was so adventurous, and the life she's living now is quite in contrast to that. It's a secret. <laughs> We're not going to talk about method. Listen, I, I, I am a method actress. I'm a member of the Actors Studio for God knows. This movie I just did, Bobby De Niro and I laughed. We did a play together 42 years ago. I got better reviews, but he got more money this time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, you know, the thing about show business that's so great for all of us is that I tell my daughter, it's like when the sun goes behind a cloud, it'll come back out again. It's a good life because you keep meeting people. It's like lifetimes that you've known before. And I said, you know what, no matter how depressed I got, I'd never kill myself. Because I'd be sitting in the coffin and somebody would walk past me to look at my body and say, oh my God, I'm so sorry she died. I had the greatest part for her. And I'd be saying, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, life's too bitter. I'm not going to cheat myself. Uh-uh, never. Not going to let that happen. But I, wanna, I do want to say that these gentlemen, our producers, man, they were there for us. They, they, you know, I've had producers that I never saw, you know, and they stopped by one time while you're shooting. Hello. How are you? Oh, nice I'm so glad you. you joined our picture. I'm so glad to meet you. I never saw them again. <laughs> These men were there every day. Were we okay? Was the room okay? You know, and did we need anything? Did, uh, were, were we getting out? We got snowbound. Did they want, we want them to go out in the middle of the snow blizzard to get us something? They were there. They were there caring and working. I mean, if you're going to make a damn movie, get on your knees and pray hard and kick dirt, and be there. Be there for the people with everything you've got. I don't care, you know, opportunity is opportunity. Make the most of it when it comes, that's all. For everybody, together, that's all. Jack, maybe you can say a little bit about that work ethic. I mean, it, it meant being there every day for 18 days, for 18 hours a and day. And Jack and Ed, you owe me $20 each <laughs> now. Well, you know, it's, it's a lot easier working on a happy set. And if, you're, if your actors are happy, if you know, then that makes everything so much easier. I mean, you know, there's, of course, crazy blizzards, and we had to, like, we had to go find little booties for Diane's dog, but it's like, <laughs> you know? It's like the dog has to go outside. There's four feet of snow. We have to, like, solve this problem. And it's going to make Diane happy. It's going to make the dog happy. It's going to make everybody on the set happy. My dog was miserable. She'd never seen snow happy. before. Yeah, she, she maybe was a little miserable. I have one dog that's show business. Dog. I have three dogs. And my secretary has a dog. So there's four dogs and my housekeeper has a dog. So on Saturday, we've gone to the dogs. But most every other day, there's four dogs there. And I leave two at home. I take one, my show business dog is, her name is Ginger. And she's a King Charles Cavalier. And she was my dog in a series I did with my daughter, Laura Dern, called Enlightened for HBO. And she was my dog every day for two years. And at the end, my grandkids said, Nana, you got to get that dog. I said, honey, Nana can't get that dog. That's a $5,000 trained dog. That dog has starred in five movies. And the trainer said, not necessarily, Miss Ladd. She said, Ginger's going deaf. And so we want to find her a good home, someone who loves her. She loves you so much. We'd love for you to take her. So I took Ginger. And, I, and, and she likes to go on set, so I take her with me. <laughs> but Ginger was going deaf. And then I found out why. that The Cavaliers, their, their sinuses, their teeth get loose and their sinuses block up. And the vets had missed it. So I took her to a specialist. She has five teeth. They had to pull all her teeth. It cost me $4,000. <laughs> so and you I saved $1,000. <laughs> saved $1,000. 
and took her on the set with me and still do. Just took her to Carolina, too. And Eden got to know Ginger, too. She's, she's a show business. She's almost a human dog, this dog. She's evolved. I can't leave her at home. No. So they were very kind. Thank you guys again very much. Well, Ms. Ladd, our, our audience would also like to know more about you and your career. Um, here's one question. You've had a long, wonderful career. What was your most challenging career moment? Or you can pick one, one among the most challenging. Paying the rent. <laughs> no, my best moment. Thanks, uh-huh, right. My best moment, we've all cried because we lost jobs. But <clears throat> my favorite film ever and greatest moment for show business moment was a film called Rambling Rose. <clears throat> and it is my favorite because, in all honesty, I felt this part was the most like the real me. And I play mother, and Bob Duval plays daddy. And Lucas Haas plays, at that time, 14 years old, my son. And Laura Dern was played the housekeeper that we hired. And I love that movie. Called to Willingham. It took 17 years for him to get that made. Martha Coolidge gave us the script. And I knocked on doors for five years. And everybody said, oh, it's too good. It, go do it for television. Mm -hmm. And it just was a miracle that it got made. And uh, my daughter and I made history as the only mother and daughter in the history of the world to both be nominated for Oscars for the same movie in the same That's year. Right. And here's the moment. Yeah. The late Princess Diana chose this film as one of her all-time favorites and flew us to London for a royal premiere and a party in our honor. And I got to meet her, and she sat right here watching me act. I've never been so nervous in my whole life. <laughs> that was my favorite show business moment, other than having been on Broadway. That was a highlight of my life. And I'm from Mississippi. My daddy was a vet who sold medicine for poultry and livestock. And I got him to let me do it at 13. And he'd give me 50 cents off a dollar. And if they didn't have a dollar, I had to go catch the chicken <laughs> and uh, trade. And I had to go up and knock on the door and say, how do you do? I'm Mr. Lanier's daughter, Diane, and I'm here today with our products for cholera, root, sore head, and white diarrhea. Better egg mash, and we also have the worming medicine for your pigs and cows and chickens and hogs. <laughs> and let me tell you, it helped me survive in show business. Unfortunately, I've had some agents who couldn't sell chicken medicine. <laughs> So it helps. Everything you do helps. So I think that was the answer that we're looking for. You need to always be selling. <laughs> Almost always. Um, another question for you, Ms. Ladd. What female actors still inspire you and why? P.S. You are one of my inspiring actors. Wow. Um, the greatest actress I ever saw was Simone Signore in a room called Room at the Top. She made me proud that I am a woman, and I hope I do that for other females. And my favorite actor was, um, was Philip Seymour Hoffman, who uh, Bob Duval is no slouch, and neither mm -hmm. is Tom Hanks and mm -hmm. Anthony Hopkins, whom I've worked with. These are all great God-given talents in the universe. Um, I was prejudiced to Philip because he was going to star in a film that I've been fighting for for 30 years. When I starred, I will share this because now is the time. Um, I've written two books about different things. One's a health book because I'm a health advocate. And then uh, one's a short story collection that the publisher was stealing all my money. And I had to take my rights back. So it'll be out again in about <laughs> four months called uh, Bad Afternoon for a Piece of Cake. Got rave reviews, short stories, wow, short stories. Maybe Ed could share with us briefly what, what he anticipates as far as how this film is going to go out to a wider audience. Sure, yeah, I mean, that's we're working on that right now. Of course, another big challenge in indie film is finding the audience. But we have a few distribution deals on the table. Our sales team's working on it. Great. I can't say anything yet, sure. but it'll be found. We, we hope we'll hear some more soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you all for yeah, allowing me to share that crew. story. If it hadn't happened today, I wouldn't have shared it. But thank you so much.